so you don't forget. Huh? So you don't forget. So, so, so I don't forget not to cuss. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm making you the host. Okay. Okay. Yes, there's one right here. Thank you. Yes, All right, sir. can you see our presentation now? Yes. And it looks like the recording's going. Hey, good morning, sir. Okay. You'll be able to see Catherine as well, correct? Yes, I can. We can see her now. Hello. Hello, Miss Gail. Good morning. Good morning to you guys. Who am I talking to? Uh, so this is Jomo Stewart. Um, I'm the comedian uh, who's been helping set this up. Uh, Jomo. This is the energy. Yes, Jomo. Great. I am so happy to be with you guys. Although I'm so sad that I'm not actually in Alaska. Huh. Uh, if you knew the temperature, you wouldn't be quite so sad. <laughs> oh, well, what, what is it? Well, I woke up, it was about negative 20. Oh, well, yes, that's true. I visited, I came to Alaska for the first time in June uh, five years ago. And, you know, that it was beautiful. It was just so spectacular. Yeah, summer is, is lovely. Yeah, it depends when you arrive. True. <laughs> right. Well, we now have over ten and a half hours of daylight. Yeah, that's And it that's makes a big difference. difference. Um, she's up and running. She can drive the bus from where she is. Okay. And I'm going to go to the table on this. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. So yeah. is uh, and anybody wants one, Jim Dodson the there and is Shay there and Scott? Yes, yeah. Scott, Shay, and Shay's Jim. here. Yes. Oh. Good. I just want to say hi to you guys. Well, hi. Hi. How are you doing? Yeah. Sorry you didn't make it, Catherine. Although I stayed at my in-laws house last night and it was actually 35 below. So. Uh, <laughs> oh, going for, uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah. no, 57 below is oh, my personal okay. best. And, Long way to go. Yeah. <laughs> I just really appreciate that we made this happen anyway. The whole effort is so yeah. important and I'm happy to meet you guys by, I mean, I can't see you, but you can see me, I guess. Or wait. Uh, well, I can see someone, LTH Alaska. That must be another gentleman joining us. Yeah, it looks like we just have a phone icon up. We don't have video on our end. We've got a good group of probably. Well, we, might all have, we might all have to get used to this, right? If we're not going to see each other in person during the coronavirus time or something. Oh, you definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I think we're, I think you guys are in charge, so we're probably ready well, to go. Well, we got maybe a minute. Why don't maybe we a minute, minute, Catherine, yeah. and then get started. We got about 10 or 12 people on this end, and then yeah, well, I think a handful like of people calling in. Okay, great. Well, we'll have to try to get you up uh, later in the year, maybe when the weather's a little warmer and we have a vaccine or something so we can all travel again. Right, I'm for that. Maybe August. Yeah, cause August is hot here, so I could come up by you guys. August is perfect here. 70 degrees. Beautiful. It's not smoky. Okay, cool. Anything else, Joe? Any more questions? Hey, Jim. Jim, you're going to manage the questions, right, in terms of who we're calling on? Quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I think what we'll do, uh, Kathleen, is we will, uh, Catherine, is uh, we will uh, introduce uh, who's here around the table when uh, we get started, and uh, once we get to question and answers, I'll, I will recognize them and tell you who is asking the question, so you know, and then we can uh, just proceed. So basically, uh, you're driving the boat, uh, but I'll help you when you need it. Okay, that's perfect. And okay, we're doing so the Q&A with Shay, Shay and Scott and I will all be answering different questions. So, um, so they're there with you. So. 
Yeah, the more the more more granular stuff about the ballot measure, Shay and I can assist. And I think Catherine's got kind of the bigger picture of the need for elections reform generally. Okay, well, why don't we get started? So we have with us this morning, uh, Catherine, uh, is it Gail? Gail? Gail, yes, a woman's name. Yeah, a, a woman's <laughs> name, cool. Uh, she, she is a business leader, entrepreneur, and political innovation activist. Um, she is uh, here today with us. Uh, talking about ranked choice voting, and uh, I know uh, Catherine, you have you're doing something with this nationally, right? That's correct. Yes, it's I sold my company five years ago, uh, in part to do this work on political innovation. After I got okay. so enormously frustrated. Okay, and we also have uh, Scott and Shay with us today, uh, who are part of that team, I guess, part of the Alaska team. Uh, sorry, we really don't know much about ranked choice vote. That is why we asked you to come. So, gather the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Jim. Thanks to everybody who's attending. I can see one person on my screen, so um, I'm going to be talking to that particular person. And and I'm just really happy that we're making this work, even though we couldn't all be together in person. I was telling these guys before we started that I first visited Alaska five years ago in June and it was spectacular. They did tell me that if I had come this time, it wouldn't have been quite as hospitable given the temperature, but nonetheless, I'm hoping to come back soon. Here's what we'll do today. Uh, get on the same page as business leaders about what the possibility is for political innovation to change what we currently see, particularly in DC. And we're gonna start with a couple of questions. And it's a little bit odd because I need audience participation and none of us are gonna be able to see each other, but we'll just uh, invent uh, that we're together as a group, okay? So think about it this way. How many people out there drink beer or wine? And then we would raise our hands. And I'm, my hand is up, I suspect many people's are. And then we keep our hands up. Oh, someone's in the room with me, her hands up too. Very high, I must say. Okay, so then uh, we keep our hands up if in general, you're very satisfied with the, result, with the choices that you have in the beer and wine industry. I am, and we keep our hands up if we vote, which I do and most of you, I'm sure. And now keep our hands up if we are in general very satisfied with the choices that we have in the politics marketplace, both ideas and candidates. And at least in the room <laughs> I'm in, down. Down. You, lost, you lost everyone. Okay, so we lost, yeah. And, and that is just a quick way of reminding ourselves why we all chose to spend this time together this morning, because we're not satisfied. And it really begs the question, why in America do we have over 6,000 breweries, 3,000 wineries, but when it comes to our politics, we basically get to choose between, as David Brooks once said, Soviet refrigerator A or Soviet refrigerator B. And that was funny to me. I don't know what the age of people are out there, but it's, it always works for me. So the, the fact is that unlike the wine and beer industry and the politics industry, we don't have healthy competition, we don't have innovation, and we don't have accountability for the lack of those things, which means we don't really have the best of what I would call free market politics, so to speak, which is what is the best of what free markets can deliver. Now, there's so much talk all the time about hyper-partisanship and a divided country I want to start with something where we all, virtually all of us agree, which is Washington is broken. It's something we say all the time, but as it turns out, this idea actually represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem. As my good friend, uh, former Republican Congressman Mickey Edwards once said, Washington isn't broken, it's doing exactly what it's designed to do. And in fact, the design, the structure of our politics industry has created a huge problem, with, which I'll illustrate for you now with a Venn diagram. If I can make the slides move, which I cannot. 
Okay, the slides are not moving. A second. Um, I have tech support. Oh, Joe has gone. Okay. Perfect. So, okay. Um, are we still the host? We're viewing her screen. I think we're. Okay. Yeah, she's in Lauren. Charge. So, hmm, let me see if I can. You can see my slides, though, right? We can see it. So whatever program you have it in, if it's a PowerPoint or a PDF, you should be able to advance. Oh, there we go. Okay, I, I there think I just have to give up on my okay. camera. I'm, I'm good. Okay. So thanks, everybody. I'm into political innovation, not technological innovation. This is the problem that we're all facing right now. There is, in our politics industry, no intersection, no connection between our elected officials acting in the public interest and the likelihood that they will get reelected. So in other words, if our elected representatives do their jobs the way we want and need them to, they're actually likely to lose those jobs. And that is a crazy design. We would never do that in any of our businesses. Uh, fortunately, we can fix this. It turns out our system's missing two critical dimensions of any functioning industry or business. We don't get results, and there's no accountability for not getting those results. And this is because we have two major structural problems with our voting system design. The first is we have party primaries. So, and we've had them for, you know, really most of our whole lives. So most elections today are actually decided in the primary and the approximately 10 to 15 to 20% of people who turn out for party primaries tend to be more ideological than the electorate as a whole. So therefore, to make it through the primary, candidates very often have to go further to the right or to the left than the voters as a whole group really want. But the real problem is not what happens in the primary, it's that the influence of that party primary extends far beyond its effect on the election. It actually affects how legislation happens or not. So imagine yourself for a moment as a federal politician. It's not just what you have to say to get elected, it's that once you're in office and you're presented with an opportunity to consider some landmark legislation, let's say a bipartisan compromise bill, representing an actual and effective solution to one of our nation's biggest problems, be it healthcare, national debt, immigration. What are the operative questions that you ask yourself? Is it a good idea? Is this the right policy for the country? Is this what the majority of my constituents want? It's none of those. The question that you're gonna ask is, Will I make it back through my partisan primary if I vote for this? And if the answer is no, and it virtually always is on any of these big issues that we never solve, then all the previous questions are virtually irrelevant because the rational incentive to get reelected dictates that you vote no. And if you vote yes, you're gonna have a primary challenger. You may have noticed that over the past 15 years, primary has ceased to be just a noun. It's now a verb, as in we're going to primary you. And what that means is we're gonna run someone further to the left if you're a Democrat or further to the right if you're a Republican, if you're not hewing the party line. Effectively, party primaries as we run them today create what I call an eye of the needle problem through which no problem-solving politician can pass. So to paraphrase this biblical proverb, I would say it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for a Democrat to vote yes on any bipartisan solution if it requires even a $1 reduction in benefits, or for a Republican to vote yes on that same solution if it requires even $1 of tax increase. And this pushing apart of two sides where they cannot come to the middle to make anything happen is one of the two reasons we don't get results. The other reason that we don't get results in our political system is, as I noted before, there's zero accountability for not getting results. There's zero accountability in our political system because the customer, the voter, only has two choices. 
So the only thing that either side needs to do to win is convince the average voter to choose them as the lesser of two evils, or because at least they say, therefore, what that voter believes. What no one has to do in this duopoly is actually deliver results. Because no matter how satisfied you are, you still likely prefer what your side says, therefore, than what the one other side says, therefore. In any other industry this big and this thriving with so much customer dissatisfaction and only two players, some entrepreneur would see it as a phenomenal business opportunity and they would create a new competitor responding to what customers want. But that doesn't happen in politics because the barriers to entry are astronomically high. That means it's just too hard for new parties or independent candidates to have any substantive success. So an example of this is when uh, the fundraising rules have been created, the two parties have worked together to craft them to protect themselves both from new competition. So for example, the most recent set of fundraising rules allow anyone on this call to give $847,000 annually to either the Democrats, the Republicans, or if you want, you could give it to both. But if you want to contribute to someone's independent campaign for the Senate, so they're not running as a Democrat or a Republican, you are limited to $5,400 every two years. It's a 313 times difference. And that's one of the barriers to entry because they can't get the capital. But it turns out that the single greatest barrier is not that. It's the way we vote. And we have this system called plurality voting, which maybe isn't a word you've even heard of because we never think about this. It's just normal to us and I'm gonna explain. So if you, uh, so in the United States, any election with more than two candidates can be won with a plurality. That means that the winner will have the most votes, but they don't necessarily have a true majority. They don't necessarily have over 50%. So for example, if you think of a three-way race, one candidate could win with just 34% of the votes with each of the two other candidates getting 33% each. And what that means is, yes, you have someone who won with only 34%, and that means 66% of voters preferred someone else. So what happened is when our founders and our framers were setting up the rules of the game, shall we say, in our democracy, there simply weren't many examples to follow. And at the time, they just copied from Britain, where they had this plurality voting, you just need the most votes, you don't need a majority system. This is something that it is highly, highly unlikely, although I can't check with them directly, but highly unlikely they would ever choose to have plurality voting today because of all we know. Turns out plurality voting is an enormous barrier to new competition because it creates what's called the spoiler effect Sometimes we don't vote for the candidate we really want because we're afraid that our vote will help elect the candidate that we like the least. If you go back and recall the uh, presidential election of 2016, if you were on the left and you were interested in Green Party candidate Jill Stein, you were definitely told, oh, you can't vote for her because the only thing you're going to do is take votes away from Hillary and, and sort of accidentally help elect Donald Trump. You'll spoil the election for Hillary. And at the same time in 2016, if you were on the right and you were more libertarian and you really wanted to vote for Gary Johnson, you were also told, boy, oh boy, you shouldn't do that because he'll never win and you'll just take votes away from Trump and spoil the election for him and help elect Hillary. But far more often than what we saw in 2016 is that the spoiler problem, the existence of it, keeps people from running in the first place. In the spring of 2019, Howard Schultz, who uh, is the former CEO and he was the founder of Starbucks and he was 
widely respected as a CEO. Well, last spring, he considered an independent run for president. And, but he had previously been a Democrat. And so the outcry from Democrats was loud and actually rather vicious because they believed that Howard Schultz would hand the 2020 election to Donald Trump. And that is precisely the kind of problem that plurality voting creates. And if there was a billionaire candidate running an independent campaign on the right, the Republicans would be equally upset with that candidate. If you think about it, politics is the only industry where we are regularly told that less competition is better for the customer. Now, it doesn't matter if you think that Howard Schultz would have been the best or the worst president ever we can still all recognize that there's something unhealthy about a system where having more talented, successful people competing is somehow bad. Plurality voting and the resulting spoiler problem is one of the two structural reasons we don't have healthy competition and accountability in our politics. As is always the case in life, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played. And the net result of the rules of the game in our voting system, which is to say the system of party primaries plus plurality voting, is that we have unhealthy competition. And the result of unhealthy competition in any industry is always that customers are not well served. So here, voters and the public interest is not well served with our politics. So to transform the system, to transform the politics industry, our highest priority has got to be breakthrough innovation in the rules of the game of elections, which is how we vote. The elections innovation that I spend all of my time now advocating for, I often call free market politics, and it solves both of these problems. Another name for this, which I often use, is final five voting or final four voting. And essentially, as we'll continue talking about, this is part of what Alaskans are proposing and that there will be a referendum on later this year. But let's talk about it in theory. So the solution is, again, free market politics, final four, politi final four voting. And it can break partisan gridlock and deliver results. And it will fundamentally change what politicians are incented to do and our ability to hold them accountable for results. So we'll, with this system, we're going to change two things, and we have to change both. We're going to change one thing in the primary election and one in the general, and it's critical to do them both together. So first, let's just get rid of broken party primaries. Instead, we are going to go to single ballot open primaries. So you will no longer vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary. Instead, when you vote in the primary, there's only one ballot and every candidate, no matter their party, including third parties and independents, every candidate running in the primary appears on that single ballot. And the top four finishers out of that primary automatically advance to the general election. Top four primaries therefore eliminate that eye of the needle problem and thus allow legislators significantly more leeway to legislate in the public interest. Second, let's get rid of this crazy system of plurality voting. Instead, let's use ranked choice voting in general elections. And I'm gonna explain what that is. So, Remember now, we would have a top four primary, so you have four candidates to think of. And I'd like you to just think of, you know, any four people that could be running in the same race. And it's like anything in life. We can regularly know that we prefer, that something's our favorite and there's something that we hate. We know that about the movies we want to see or the food we want to eat or not. And here's, uh, oh, I'm going to skip that. Here's how it looks on the ballot, essentially. You have four choices, and the first one is really, oh my gosh, this is the person I absolutely want. The second is, well, I could live with that person if they get elected, I would be fine with that. And third is perhaps, well, if I have to, or maybe third is even, who is that? I haven't really heard of them. But then you also usually know the one you absolutely want the least. 
And that's obviously your last choice, your over my dead body choice. Now, you don't write it quite like this on the ballot. Here's how it works on the actual ballot. There's a simple grid. So here I've got some founders running against each other and I have Alexander Hamilton as my first choice because I love the musical. And then I rank the rest of my choices. And as you see here, James Madison is last for me. Now, when we've all cast our ballots, and by the way, you don't have to rank them all. If you only wanna rank your top two, that's fine. We all cast our ballot. The polls close and we, the first place votes are counted. And if one of these four candidates gets a true majority over 50%, then the election's over, that candidate wins. But if the leader falls short of 50%, technology enables instant runoff voting. So the last place candidate is automatically eliminated and voters who had selected that candidate, who's now out, automatically have their second choice counted instead. You rerun the totals, and this process continues until you have a true majority winner. It's basically a series of runoffs, but instead of having to keep coming back for another election, you cast all your votes at once. Ranked choice voting eliminates the spoiler argument and it also ensures that we elect the candidate with the most appeal to the greatest number of voters. Elimination of the spoiler argument eliminates that single greatest barrier to new competition and leads to healthy competition to solve problems and deliver real results for real people. Now remember our initial Venn diagram? So I want to revisit it here with our solution. So Initially, I said there was no connection between elected officials acting in the public interest and their likelihood of getting reelected. But on, with the solution, final four voting, free market politics, we've now created that intersection. Politicians are incented to solve problems. They're incented to do what we as a country need them to do. So now when this, when let's remember, you're, you can think of yourself as a federal politician again, you have an opportunity to consider the same piece of bipartisan landmark legislation solving one of our biggest challenges. Now you can actually vote yes. You can say to yourself, well, under the old system, I never would have made it back through my party primary if I voted for this. But under this new system, I'm really 100% sure that I'm gonna be in the top four. You know, I'm super popular, I'm the incumbent, I'm well known, I'm gonna be in the top four and then in the general election with a combination of first and second choice votes, I will still be able to craft a win. This system, free market politics, realigns the incentives. And if we implement both top four primaries and ranked choice voting at the same time, we're gonna get results and accountability. And what's really interesting is that these better results are achievable in a matter of years as momentum builds. We actually don't need, as a country, all 50 states to change these rules at the same time in order to make a difference. Think about this. If we had just five states with perhaps Alaska leading the way, sending their delegations to Washington who were elected through final four voting, we'd immediately have 10 senators and maybe uh, 50 representatives who could serve as a vital new fulcrum solving problems and taking action. So they would still be ideologically different, but they would be motivated to respond to the entire electorate and they would not be automatically pushed so far away from each other that, that they simply prefer gridlock to getting anything done. So it really only takes a few states to begin to improve the possibilities for better results for the entire country. And that is the power of what I call political innovation. You can see on the slide here, one of the things I like to say is America was founded on the greatest political innovation of modern times and political innovation remains the key to our future. So before I get into what we should do next, I'm going to give you one quick example. This system of healthy competition is less about changing who gets elected. It may do that sometimes, but it actually may not do that. It's not that we need different people, we need people to act differently. And competition does this 
And here's an example. So go back to 1992. Some of you may remember that Ross Perot ran as an independent in 1992. And one of his two key issues was the national deficit and debt. And he would have these television commercials and he would have these little charts and he was totally focused on saying that this, this was unsustainable. He has been since 92 commonly remembered as a spoiler, which is that many people believe that Perot cost George H.W. Bush a second term. But it has since been proven statistically that Perot drew votes equally from both parties, so he didn't affect the ultimate election result. But what's interesting is how beneficial the additional competition was, even when he didn't, he wasn't himself the one who won. Because on November of 92, 19% of the electorate cast their votes per, for Perot. They knew they were quote unquote wasting their votes, but they cared so much about the debt and deficit that they wanted to essentially, you know, register that protest vote. And when both sides of the duopoly, Republicans and Democrats, saw how important that issue was, they were absolutely motivated to do something about it because neither one wanted to cede that issue to a nascent third party, which would sort of mean less for both of them. Because that's you know, what competition does, bring in new ideas and force accountability. And neither party had had debt and deficit in its platform uh, you know, in the way that Perot created it for them. So because of that, the Clinton administration often gets credit, credit for these uh, balanced budgets. When in fact, both the Democrats in the White House and Democrats and Republicans in Congress came together to solve this issue and the real credit should go to Perot and to healthy competition because that's what gave everybody the incentive to do it. So the natural question is, what's next? How can we get final four voting passed? And not just in Alaska, but around the country. And I often actually propose now final five voting, but I'm thrilled with final four or final five. The US Constitution delegates almost everything about elections to the state. So these rules aren't in the Constitution. So each state needs to change them individually, either through legislation or through citizens initiative, like what you have in Alaska. So we, part of what my work is nationally is to try to get these campaigns going in all 50 states. And I'm so happy to be talking to you guys because you actually have a real campaign in your state, which means that what's next for the people on this call and in the room is to join up with this campaign. Do everything you can to make it successful. Tens of thousands of Alaskans have already submitted signatures to put this on your ballot, but it will need a lot of support between now and the time it needs your votes when it's on the ballot. There are two additional people with us this morning from the organization running this campaign, which is called Alaskans for Better Elections. We have the campaign manager, Shay Siegert, and their consultant, Scott Kendall. And when I close, which I will shortly, they're going to be with us for Q&A, so you guys can get all the detailed information you might want to have about how this referendum is moving along. We also have to not just support this ourselves, but we have to evangelize. Uh, so for you guys, you'll need to be telling all your friends and family that this is something they should support and should vote yes on, and ideally that they would get involved actively engaged in supporting ongoingly. Essentially, I, I like to say to people, you know, if you, if you became, if you had a friend or a family member with a huge problem, and you became aware of a solution, you would stop at nothing to help get it to them. And right now our democracy demands that same passion. And I believe this is the best solution we have in front of us. So we have to start talking about it. It's time to talk politics at our family gatherings, our business events, cocktail parties. And this works because it's totally nonpartisan. It's not a Trojan horse for either party's advantage. I will tell you guys that over the last year, I have a 100% success rate with all my seatmates on the airplane. And 
you know, I give myself an A, I grade myself now, and I give myself an A if I can draw the Venn diagram on the cocktail napkin, you know, before we take off. We can work together and work with our partners at Alaskans for Better Elections to achieve this huge change to our political system. You can also find for the purpose of furthering your understanding and also telling people why this is a good idea, you can get more information on our, oops, on our website, which I'll have up at the end of this uh, presentation. You can also buy our book. My publisher like requires me to say this. Um, and our book <laughs> called The Politics Industry is coming out in June and all the proceeds from this book go to this Institute for Political Innovation that is driving these reforms across the country. So if you like what we're saying, do please buy the book because it will go right into making this happen. Um, in closing, historically, the American political system was a critical foundation of the United States success, and yet today it stands in the way of virtually every important issue we need to address. Yet I believe we have every reason to be optimistic. And perhaps even profoundly optimistic, because now that we understand the design of the system, it's so clear why it doesn't work. And it's also so clear what are the first things we need to do to fix it. I'd like to close with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, although it's possibly didn't really say it, but he's, he's credited with it. We don't have American government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. And historically, at least for me, I thought that meant I needed to participate by voting. But it turns out it also means that we citizens need to participate in the design of the rules of the game of our politics industry. Reclaiming the promise of our republic, the great American experiment, is the challenge of our time. So I hope you will join us. And now we will move to Q&A. Thank you so much. Here's our website. All right, uh, Catherine, this is Jim. Uh, how many other states have an initiative process in the works? So there are 26 states that have a, that constitutionally in their state can run initiatives. And you guys, Alaska is the only one that is on target to have this comprehensive solution on the ballot in 2020, which is to say your referendum will fix both the broken party primaries and fix plurality voting. There are other states where they have ranked choice voting on the ballot in November, such as Massachusetts and Maine already passed ranked choice voting. But when we really understand competition, Ranked choice voting, so one half of this solution on its own, is not even half of the benefit of the two together. So my, my biggest hope will absolutely be for Alaska, because you're really creating what's optimal to get results. Whereas ranked choice voting on its own can be said to create, quote unquote, more representative uh, results. But what I care about is, yeah, I, I'm totally for things being representative, but I really care about what people are likely to do once they're elected. And that's what the combination works on. All right. So may I, sir? It's Joma. So just so I'm clear again, right now, I thought that Maine is the only state that has ranked choice voting. Yeah. So what Catherine was saying is other states have it on the ballot the ballot coming up and then five cities nationwide have it um, upcoming implementations including um, Amherst Massachusetts and New York City um, they have upcoming implementations and then five states I believe are using it for their Democratic presidential primary like Alaska and Hawaii but again um, I, I if I could break in for a moment don't consider what Alaskans are trying to do as being the same as the places that are just trying to put in ranked choice voting. What you're doing is all about healthy competition. What ranked choice voting on its own does, and I still support it, is it sort of works to make things feel better 
but has a much less powerful effect on the actual legislative results. So again, I'm totally for ranked choice voting, but that's not what you're doing. You are doing final five voting, which is primaries plus ranked choice voting. So top four primaries plus ranked choice voting. And one oh, final quick, four, sorry. Quick, yep. So top four open nonpartisan primary. That was my question. Um, and there is a preference if you would like to have an R or a D or an L or a G next to your name on the primary if you're a candidate you can, um, but what it doesn't show is, it doesn't show Republican primary candidates, and it doesn't show Democratic pro primary candidates. What it shows is all of them on the same list, and if they would like to designate a party, they can yeah. in parentheticals next to their name. Yeah, it kind of removes the gatekeeping function, whereas now- It's really it's nonpartisan primary. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Democrats yeah, can put perfect. forward one and only one candidate. Republicans can put forth one and only one candidate. And anyone else who wants to participate has these barriers, whether it's signature gathering for a petition candidate or marginal parties. I think Alaska is <clears throat> uniquely positioned to lead on this because now I think the numbers keep creeping up. But I think the last I checked, 62% of Alaskans don't affiliate with either major party. Um, you know, we sort of, many of us operate in the middle. And then, you know, we're kind of forced to choose from the menu of two things on the fringes. And so, um, as we've seen in some recent elections, it sometimes comes down to a matter of, well, two choices, who do I hate less? And that's not, I mean, it's, as everything Catherine said, that's not a healthy way to actually get, for example, a fiscal crisis solved in your state. I'm just trying to remember what we have. Right, and actually what's interesting is under a system like this, it's quite possible that many of us will like Democrats and Republicans much better than all of those that are identifying as independents now in Alaska do. And they'll like them better because they will have more freedom to be doing things that, that the voters like, which is solving problems. So I, this is actually very good for voters, but it's also really good for elected officials who want the freedom to do what they will say behind closed doors, they know needs doing, but they'll say behind closed doors, yes, we should, we should have this compromise uh, for our national debt, but it, because it requires both some tiny tax increase and some benefit decrease, both, neither side can ever vote for it, but they'll say behind closed doors they need to do it. Whereas now under this system, if they evaluate it should be done, both sides could do it. So it could increase our satisfaction with people in the existing duopoly. Yeah, I mean, to take it to, uh, to put a fine point on what Catherine says, because right now in Alaska, and Catherine may not have this level of background, but we've got a bipartisan majority in one of our legislative bodies who's kind of guiding the ship away from really too much extreme. They're kind of paralyzed in that they can't really solve the problems. They're just kind of out there pre preventing bad things from happening. But broadly, Alaskans support this 25 of 40 people but there are, there are people in the works from the right, certainly, to primary those Republicans who dare participate in a bipartisan coalition. There are some people even on the left who say they're not pushing this or that issue enough. You know, we need to better to be in the minority than to participate in this watered down version. And so we've got a system that fundamentally punishes good behavior. And, you know, a system that does that, I mean, and, and I'm just kind of reading the room here, but I think there's a lot of people that think if we can get you know 25 or 30 of the best legislators who can work together safely then we ought to be able to foster and support that and i'm i'm in a position where i have good relationships in the legislature from formerly working uh, in juno and i would say it is shocking the level of support you have from people who have actually made their careers and succeeded under the existing rules so many of them say oh my gosh you know if if, if there was a secret ballot we could solve we've got what's called the permanent fund dividend issue here which is sort of existential if we could do a secret ballot, we could solve this and have a supermajority tomorrow, but I'm not touching it because in the Republican primary, the, you know, the checks we pay out to citizens being as large as they could be, as in, that's an article of faith. That's actually in the Republican Party platform up here, believe it or not, because it's a semi-socialist idea of paying money back. But that, that is what our, our moderate Republicans face. And Democrats at the other end of the spectrum say, hey, maybe we can't pay out as big a check. And they face tension from the far left as well, 
when really I think people in this room would know, okay, we use a little of this money, maybe, you know, Alaska goes back to either a sales tax or an income tax is modest. We can balance this budget tomorrow. We've got the wealth to do it and we can't do it because of party politics. I just got some questions. Yeah, I was going to ask Catherine and the gentleman here, um, if Alaska is in the range of 62%, I'll say independent, or at least not strictly partisan, and I think that is the case because I work as an election official, is that unusual in the country or is it really the case that across the United States there's an increasing level of independence? I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, uh, that's a fabulous question and your intuition is exactly correct. So in the latest polls, it's close to 50%, so north of 45% of people identifying as independents, they'll self-identify, they'll say, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm an independent. And then it's about, it's under 30% then for each of the two parties. And yet we still only hear about those two parties because there's nowhere for those identifying with another, uh, you know, with neither of the parties to go. And it's not to say, by the way, that all of those people who identify as independent are in the middle. Um, they may be more extreme, less extreme, just different than. And in this system, we can, they will have a place to go and their ideas will begin to be able to influence what happens even in the Republican or Democrat parties as well. So I should say one thing, These, this, free market politics, this political innovation focused on results is not about creating a big squishy middle and splitting the difference on every issue. In fact, this system will, can, will actually create an opportunity for new ideas and innovations to continue to come forward. Because right now, if you think about it in the general election, at most, if we have a competitive election, we get to hear a Democrat idea and a Republican idea. And a lot of times they're kind of similar to what we've heard ongoingly. Well, now in, let's say you had your Senate election and you had four candidates, even if there was some sense that one or two were the only ones who were truly competitive, the other two candidates are, whoever their voters choose as their second choice will also impact the race. And so their ideas will be listened to and that creates an opportunity for new ideas to come into the system because you don't want to say that all the solutions are in the middle. They're not. And innovations generally, when they're created, they start at, quote unquote, more of the extremes. But it, it allows for that right balance of having this debate on new ideas and yet not being overtaken by a new idea that's only supported by a plurality. So it's a super great balance and will not create just one split the difference government. Mike? Uh, yeah, um, you identified approximately three different groups, uh, Republicans, Democrats, and independents. Uh, it strikes me that all three of those groups, more people don't vote than do vote. Uh, I don't know the actual statistics, but not very many people vote anymore if they ever did. Uh, do you see this ranked choice voting and, uh, you know, top four uh, improving turnout? So I'll actually, I'll, I'll make a comment and then I'll turn it over to Shay because he might have more specific figures. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of people have this concern and that's why some reformers have focused on how can we get, how can we increase turnout? And what I say to people about that now is if we increased turnout, but kept only the same two choices operating under the exact same current incentives, it would just be more absolute votes with no change in you know, results, other than it might change who gets elected, but they still wouldn't be incented to solve our problems. So what I say to people is put in this system of final four voting, and then everybody's vote will matter not just in who wins, but it will matter in what they do. And then that's the way to get people to participate because it will be worth their time. Um, having said that, there is some evidence that you know, RCV does increase, increase participation and I, and I think it does. I, I don't think 
it's, uh, we haven't had it in so unbelievably many states that we, I think we have statistics that we can completely validate, but it certainly makes sense that given that votes will matter, that it will increase that. Shay, do you have something that you talk about on that? Yeah, so it's a little bit more specific to Alaska, I think beyond ranked choice voting um, here to look at is moving to that single ballot system for the primary, the open primary. There's so many people that are disenfranchised or feel disenfranchised by the fact that they go into the primary ballot and let's say you have you live in downtown Anchorage, you're a nonpartisan, not speaking from experience here, and you want to vote for Lisa Murkowski for Senate, then in the primary, then I can't turn around and vote for a Democrat in the House. As a nonpartisan voter, I'm forced to take either a Democratic ballot or a Republican ballot, as you know. At that, like, I enjoy voting and I want to vote. My friends who are similar age look at that and say, well, why would I vote in the primary? I can't vote for who I want for each race. And I think that's a big thing that drives down turnout in the primaries here in Alaska. And you see this time after time after time. Um, I ran, I've run races in Alaska for a while now and, and, saw, and seen firsthand that turnout in the primary here is absolutely dismal. And, and it's hard not to say that's due to the fact that voters feel marginalized into one group or the other because they can't truly vote for who they want. And I think that really is a big driver of, of turnout in the primary. And on ranked choice voting, when you put your four top four drivers of turnout from the primary onto the general and then have ranked choice voting, I think it's pretty easy to correlate that that's going to in turn drive up turnout. So for instance, the 1994 gu gubernatorial race, instead of having Jim Sykes who pulled like 5% on the general ballot, you have Stephen McAlpine, Tony Knowles, Arlister Jalewski, and Jim Campbell, four top drivers of turnout in the state. And so I think it, it for me, I correlate the two okay, this is going to drive up turnout. You saw it in Nevada's ranked choice voting presidential Democratic primary. They had, I believe, 75% increase in turnout. And, you know, there's probably a bunch of driving factors, a lot of candidates on the ballot, um, but it's hard not to say part of that wasn't due to ranked choice voting because people felt their vote was going to count more. Yeah, a little bit of a follow-up on that because there is some statistical information is – when states have two things we know when states go from a closed party to um, an open primary turnout goes up in some jurisdictions they've seen turnout go up as much as 50 percent the other thing they know is <clears throat> once you're a primary voter you are virtually handcuffed into being a general voter so every new person you put in the pot for a primary is essentially virtually guaranteed to vote in the general and then there's the drop-off effect of my candidate didn't make it, you know, through the, the Democratic primary, so I'm not going to show up. Now they're on the ballot, so you're showing up for them, and then you're you're ranking your second choice. And that, it, it all kind of rotates back to um, uh, elected official behavior, because if you really boil it down, and I've, I've really parsed through some of the primaries in Alaska, because, of course, I worked on Lisa Murkowski's write-in campaign, so I'm mean, incredibly familiar with the broad will of the public being thwarted by a small group of primary voters. And what you really get in, in large part is um, you get 20%-ish total turnout, but what you really get is 12% of the population picks your Republican candidate. So say it's a, it's a Republican House seat or Senate seat, it's almost virtually decided that it's going to go to Republican, 12% turnout for that election. So you've got an elected official who is literally catering to 7%. And ask yourself if perhaps the most extreme 7% of either the state or any district are going to make the best choices that are going to sort of dictate the winner of a race. And we saw that, I mean, Senator Murkowski had to, you know, do what had never been done, which was run right in, not only run a right in, but run a right in against both major parties. Um, so you can really see how a fraction of a fraction can decide this thing. But when you, and I love this term, when you institute free market politics, Lisa Murkowski's on that ballot, and frankly, in ranked choice voting, I know the data from that election 
in the ultimate runoff, you know, she won with 40%. She would have beaten Joe Miller something like 67-33. And that's where all Alaskans felt. And you end up with people elected who 60 plus percent of the state can live with rather than someone who caters to a hardcore of 38-39 percent. Let's get to Jeff. So a couple of things. The initiative covers what elections in Alaska? So this is elections, um, and, and sorry, Catherine, if I'm stepping over you, but oh, no, this please. is the first yeah, this is the first attempt to, as Catherine said, do a comprehensive approach. There's some that have done ranked choice. There's been some states that have done open primaries. Actually, Arkansas has done open primaries for decades, which is strange, but they have a very functional legislature there. But this is the first one to say, soup to nuts, every election. State, we want our state legislature to function. We want our federal uh, c congressional delegation to function. We want our executive to function. So soup to nuts, every election runs the same way. Everyone gets in. Are you including the four borough and city elections? No, okay. no. So every every election run by this, I should I should clarify because as, as Catherine said, all federal elections are actually a function of state law. So the states decide how they elect their delegation. So everyone, state house, state senate, executive, and our congressional delegation will be elected this way. Municipalities, it's expected there's already a movement afoot in in Anchorage at least to start looking at this because Anchorage what it has is very costly runoffs. They run an election, then they get down to two candidates, then they run a runoff and they, they duplicate the cost of election 30 days later, which is just as a, in terms of government waste, a dumb way to operate. So presidential primaries and presidential elections not affected. Muni and city, so city council and municipal races not affected. But state house, state senate, and national delegation or federal delegation are affected. And so governor and lieutenant. And governor. governor. Governor and lieutenant governor, sorry. So, so Senate, uh, U.S. Senate, U.S. Representative, but not President. Yes, sir. Okay. And then the second question I have is, um, is what is Alaska's legislative history on this? There are actually pieces of this, and I know that I helped draft this, is piece, parts and pieces of this have been proposed. Ranked choice voting for the general has been proposed, never went anywhere, big surprise. Open primaries or some version of open primaries been proposed, never went anywhere, big surprise, because the parties come in and tell their elected representatives, you better kill that in this committee or that committee. So we actually took pieces of legislation that have been run multiple times, married them together, added some additional campaign disclosures, and that's the package. So these are ideas that have probably since about 2000 have circulated, percolated up, gone away. Um, it's come from, you know, frankly, it's been proposed by um, the open primary side has been proposed by Republicans who are moderate, who are like, I am tired of, you know, running this gauntlet every two years just because I happen to work with a Democrat now and then. And I want to say something. Uh, so I speak all around the country and tell a certain story, and it's also in the book, which is that when I'm speaking, I say, to make the point that this is totally bipartisan, that, oh, all the way back in 2002, Alaska had a referendum at the time that was to put in ranked choice voting. And then I play a recording. So back in 2002, there was a robo call that ran in Alaska. And when I press play, the voice that comes on is Senator John McCain urging Alaskans to vote yes on ballot measure X to put ranked choice voting in Alaska. And then right after that, I say, and also in 2002, there was a Senate bill in Illinois to put ranked choice voting in Illinois party primaries. And the sponsor of that bill was then State Senator Barack Obama. So I'm able in these national presentations to say that both John McCain and Barack Obama supported one of the pieces of what we're proposing. And they knew what plurality voting does. And uh, that tends to help people understand that this is not something that's designed as I call it a Trojan horse for party advantage. It is for the advantage of citizens, but it's really even more than that, just for the advantage of getting results, of having incentives in the system that are aligned. So, you know, in our businesses, we basically say, you know, what you incent gets done, what you pay for gets done, et cetera. We're just setting up the rules to get what we're getting. It, and it's guaranteed that it doesn't matter who we elected. We're going to 
who we elect is we're going to keep getting what we're getting because that's what the rules give us. So we have to change them. And I, I beg of you in Alaska to lead the way. It would be so unbelievably exciting. I'll tell you something else. So when Maine passed ranked choice voting a couple of years ago, my daughter was then 11. And I woke her up after midnight at her request because she knew because i had told her that this was the most important election of her lifetime to date i mean i had explained to her that we need to change these rules of the game for anything to work and so the idea that maine was able to do that was so transformational and now with alaska what you guys can do with this package of top four primaries, ranked choice voting general elections is outstanding and would lead the way. Okay, we got three questions here, Listen, and then we'll try to wrap it up. Um, Jomo? Okay, um, so first of all, nuts and bolts. How, how do you become one of the magic four, top four nonpartisan open primary? How, how do you become one of the four? So you run in the primary, register as a regular candidate, you run, no need to be a petition candidate or a party candidate, just put your name in. And when they tally it up, you're, you get the fourth most or, or better votes and you're on to the general. And then you're on to the general. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In some races, there's only going to be four people. Some races, there might only be three people. But what we've seen in these sorts of systems is the person never thought they'd run runs. The person who's a business person or otherwise and isn't a party activist says, I've got something to bring to this debate. So you end up with five, six, seven people. That gets distilled down to four people. Those four go to the ranked choice general. Okay. And then as far as there's, a, there's quite a bit of money, uh, which I don't believe we've discussed very much um, in this. I mean, this is a 26-page initiative. Do you want to just really quickly, while we have it on, on recording, but just how does, how does this affect uh, campaign finance reform, donor transparency, and limitation on dark money. Yeah, and that's a real quick, and that's not an area that um, I don't think at least Catherine particularly uh, advocates about, but this is sort of the gloss, which is special to Alaska, is in 2014, we had the Senate race against Begich and Sullivan. And I use that as an example because 56 plus million dollars were spent, and on a per vote basis, that is the most expensive campaign in American history. And so we see that outside money or even money within this can just be dumped into an election. And the problem we've got is because of Citizens United, if you sort of sanitize your money through an outside entity, no one knows where the money comes from. Right today, I could give $5 million to the RGA or the American Chamber of Commerce, and they could make a donation in, in a race in Alaska, and no one would ever know I did it. My fingerprints are off it. And what this says is we're going to have the state-of-the-art Dark money is what they call that kind of money, prohibition, where when your money hits Alaska's border, you're going to attribute it to one of your donors. Unless you are a corporation that made the money, an individual who earned the money, if you're one of these entities that doesn't really generate its own money, you're going to tell us where you got that money or you're not going to play in our elections. And that's something that we believe Citizens United allows. Citizens United said unlimited independent spending as long as it's independent, but disclosure will cure the problem. And the disclose, when that blew kind of a hole through every state's campaign disclosure laws, there really hasn't been a remedy, and that's seen as the remedy. There's one other little piece where any entity that gets 50% uh, or more of its money from outside Alaska will just kind of disclose that in addition. But really, the heart of it is you know who's trying to influence your vote. Okay. You're right. Um, yeah. Thanks again for, for presenting. Um, what uh, arguments from opposition are you so, I think, Catherine, did you hear that question? You, I didn't hear, the, no, could you repeat it? It was, um, what, what are the arguments we're hearing against the package, the, this ballot measure? And, and I'll take the, the first stab at it. So for the, um, recently in the ADN, there is an article that was written by Jace, Jacob Posick of the Heritage Foundation of Maine. And basically he said, that ranked choice voting is too confusing for voters. Like we're going to throw out and you're not going to elect a majority because a majority of people are going to be confused or a small section. And so he threw out this number of 8,000 ballots got thrown out 
um, due to spoiled ballots, meaning someone filled out ranked choice voting poorly and the DOE had, the main DOE had to throw out the ballot. Well, we went back and looked at the numbers and really when you look at it, it was 6,000 people who just didn't vote in that race at all. And he was talking about the congressional race and I believe it was in the main first um, congressional district was that he, he was saying, well, 8,000 people filled out their ballots wrong. No, actually it was about 6,500 people did not vote at all. So you take that out and you have 1,500 people who either undervoted or overvoted, being they ranked one, two, one, or one, two. The people who still ranked one, two, still their votes count just until you get to the second choice. The people who voted one, two, one, yes, they were confused and their ballots get thrown out. But that only accounts for 400 ballots. So 400 people were confused by ranked choice voting. 6,500 didn't vote at all, and the other, the remainders just undervoted and still got counted. Catherine, so I think, I think the, the argument boiled down is too confusing, but what we've seen routinely, because many local governments use this, and Australia has actually had it nationally for 100 years or more, is that 99% of the time, people do it correctly. So it's much like, and you know what we see now. I mean, sometimes people screw up a very simple, you know. Hanging chance. Yeah, and in, yeah and having, having hand counted Lisa Murkowski's <laughs> ballot, believe me, a lot of people, you know, one and a half to two percent got it wrong and couldn't figure out how to vote right. But the, the numbers appear to not um, support that attack. And the other thing is, I think, something Catherine touched on, which is this idea of a mushy middle. You're not going to get, you know, kind of trailblazing people. And I I mean, my counter to that would be, no, what you're going to get is what you've seen in some areas where, you know what, a moderate Republican is going to say, I'll work on immigration reform. I'll, you know, I'll consider a sales or an income tax because it's the right thing to do. And they'll, they'll cross the line of the article of faith and then they'll empower people. And that's true at both ends. You'll get a Democrat who will cross over here and say, I'll, I'll, I'll consider that economic, uh, you know, I'll, I'll consider that particular uh, economic program, you know, because... I think it's good policy, and I'll cross over and I'll work with that Republican on that. So, you, I think what you see is innovation that actually becomes actualized because people can work with each other and actually get a majority and rather than just and the, stay at the fringe and talk. The, about it. the more fun opposition that we've received as a youngest sibling, I really like this one because I like to throw rocks at everyone. Um, on the on the Republican side, they say it's a liberal liberal hive mind idea, like they're trying to. <laughs> you know, electioneer. And on the liberal side, they say it's a Republican hive mind idea and you're trying to electioneer and we're here in the middle and saying like, no, this is just a good idea and both of you guys don't like it. So that there's makes nothing that stops. <laughs> there's nothing that stops the parties from having something that comes in advance where they get to choose their standard bearer that would go on to the major ballot. So the parties have their free speech and association rights to get together, get in convention, pull their members and say, this is our official candidate. What they don't have anymore is the ability to force the state to run a primary process at the gatekeeping process that keeps people off the ballot. So they lose that ability. They retain their ability to say, whoever it is, you know, Mark Begich is our candidate. I don't care who else you see on the ballot. They can say that. What they don't have anymore is the ability to say, and this other person has no pathway to the general election ballot. Okay, Mike. Yeah, uh, my recollection of 2002 was that the Green Party was really instrumental in getting the uh, ranked ch choice voting on the uh, ballot. I also seem to recall that our local League of Women Voters came out against it, and for their own reasons. And I don't think we should allow that to happen again, if possible, that we need to educate the League of Women Voters because they have such a huge influence mm -hmm. here in well, Burbank. So what should we do about it? Let them know what's in here. Well, you, you, you've read our minds because Shay and I are leaving this meeting and meeting with members of the League of Women Voters <laughs> yes, literally half an hour from now. So, right. But it's true, um, and we've seen that. Let me, break in. Let me break in for just a moment there. So I just, yeah. I can't tell exactly who's speaking, but I heard that Shay and I, and did that mean Shay and Scott are meeting with League of Women Voters? Yes, ma'am. Correct. Yeah, and, and what would make a big difference also is if it wasn't 
quote unquote, just Shay and Scott from who officially work with the campaign, but that there were business leaders like those of you in the room who go with Shay and Scott or go on your own. And because it's clear, you know, that Shay and Scott are for it. They, they can use your support to be part of this uh, lobby to these organizations to say, get on board. It's really important. That's, that's where your engagement will make a difference. Yeah, I think that's just right because League of Women Voters in different states have, a, have opposed or supported reforms like this. They supported something like the permanent fund. We had the, an automatic voter registration ballot measure. They supported that. And so it's important that we present this. It's nonpartisan. It's just improving the system. And we're hopeful to get support from them for sure. But I, I think Catherine is 100% right. When a Jim Dodson or Mike Music comes in the room and says, I don't work for them, but this seems to be a better way. Look at the way our state government's functioning. Look at the national politics. This, this seems to be a better way. I think that resonates with them. Jack. So is this on the ballot or are we still gathering signatures? So this is, um, the, the status quo of this is we gathered signatures. It's been confirmed we have enough signatures. Um, the attorney general said, you can't do this. We disagreed. We went to Superior Court. We won. Um, the attorney general went to the Supreme Court. We just had our arguments there. We are, I will say, extremely optimistic about our chances at the Supreme Court. They're probably going to come out with their decision like in June. So we're full speed ahead because um, just, you know, not to mire you in the case law and all of that, but I think the opposition to it, both in court and otherwise, has been, I mean, universally when it's come, it's come from either fringe. It's come from the far right or the far left. And that's where the legal challenge has generated by the far right. They, they don't want... They don't want to lose that power of gatekeeping the ballot. And what happened? What What does the ballot actually say? I mean, there's got to be something on the ballot besides uh, the 200 ranked choice or that, initiative. So that is the full, what you've got in front of you, and Catherine, I apologize, you can't see, it's the full text of the ballot measure. And of course, when you change one thing, like changing, making these changes, changes the definition of a party. So you've got to make, the three reforms are it, but you have to change 20 different statutes because all of them are interconnected campaign finance and elections. But on the ballot, you're going to see about a 150 word description that basically just encapsulates the three main reforms. It's going to say 26 pages. No, maybe, it's going to say open nonpartisan primaries. Parties won't run their primaries anymore. Ranked choice voting, brief explanation, and dark money. And we have that actual language because the state had to kind of agree with us that this is an accurate description. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. And is that that language here? Or that, that is not. Okay. You've got the text of the initiative, and we can get you the ballot language, which is going to be just basically like that first paragraph in length. It's, it's relatively. Yeah, maybe you could send that out to everybody who was on the, at this meeting. On the yeah, panel. absolutely. Yes. I'll, I'll put it in the notice. So again, we've really we've crossed the major threshold as far as signature gathering. It yes. would just be a once if the Supreme Court renders that this is okay to go to ballot. It will be on the ballot this Correct. Fall. So yeah. no further signature gathering. No, like no, no like further. Election. Right now, this is all about, and we've started this process, um, but it's continuing the process of coalition building. Because we have meetings like this, and I will say, when we get the chance to explain what we're doing, um, and, and I say this with all realism, that it's, it's a challenge because we are going to lead the country if we enact this. But I would say three out of four people we talk to end up coming out of it saying, I don't see a possible argument against this. This is just better. Okay. Question on financing, if I may. Um, of the money that you've raised for your organization, how much of it have you raised from Alaska and how much is, is outside of Alaska? So it has been predominantly outside of Alaska um, and we're, we actually over disclose on our website. We say, you know, we're going to play by the rules as we think they should be. So we, we tell very clearly where our money comes from. What I will say, what's interesting about this, it was a local Alaskan who actually just independently, he's a retired petroleum engineer. He donated $50,000 to just do research and design this. And then really this was created, all Alaskan money, this thing was created. And then we literally went to national election reform advocates and said, this is what we've written, what do you think? And the support came because they said, wow, look at, Alaska's got a state-of-the-art approach. They have 62% registered with neither party, they thought this was the opportunity to kind of lead the way. For example, okay. I, have I have donated to 
not not huge amounts of money, but I've put my money where my mouth is for the Alaska campaign. So I'm an example of the out-of-state money. Okay. Well, uh, one follow-up question on financing: How much of the money that's that's raised under this organization would be prohibited by the law that's that's um, that's uh, envisioned? That is, zero, are you has zero any percent. of this money? So, so none like of I this said, be closed. Our Right, because what we're doing is we're disclosing not only the entity that has given, but the person who's donated to that entity. So um, Unite America has been a big donor, and we freely disclosed that Catherine Murdoch was kind of the ultimate source of some of that money. Um, there's on the other end of this, uh, another major donor is um, the Arnold family. It's a, it's a large philanthropic family. So we are sort of, we're over-disclosing under the state of the art right now to say, this is what elections should look like. Do we wish, you know, we had more money raised in state? We absolutely do. Um, you might be shocked to learn that there are very few people of wealth in Alaska who are, you know, a big election law uh, advocates. But we are building support. We've got we've got Alaska donors. We've got a ton of Alaska volunteers and grassroots. So we're kind of building that machine. But I think the folks out of state just see like this is good policy. This is you could take what we've put together. And you could put it in Oregon, you could put it in Idaho, and it would just dramatically improve things. So, you know, it's, it's kind of also, the first time Alaska. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I want to say there is a huge opportunity for, you know, political philanthropy in Alaska. So, for those of you on this call, uh, if you could donate, that would be enormous. I mean, even just the numbers of people from Alaska donating, even if it isn't uh, matching what some of the national uh resources are it would be huge and telling your friends who are philanthropists that this is a worthwhile philanthropy is very powerful because here's the thing so many people are philanthropists want to improve education or they want to improve health care or you know or some natural resource issue that you have in alaska all of which are important and therefore that's let's say good philanthropy, but imagine what it would be like if we could put our money into something that would then improve how the government spends their huge sums on healthcare, education, or whatever are your natural resource issues in Alaska. That is a huge ROI for philanthropy. So I do invite those of you on the call and your friends and colleagues to consider a portion of their philanthropy and their civic engagement to go into these rules of the game of elections because there's real uh, real return on investment there. Okay, well, being uh, 915 and uh, certainly appreciate uh, your time, Catherine, Jay, and Scott. I appreciate you coming and appreciate the information. Um, I think uh, we will have somebody from uh, the other view. Yes. Yeah. Is that scheduled to film? Not yet. But, but I'm, I'm sure they'll come across. <coughs> we're, we're actually looking for them. We haven't, haven't found them, I think. Anyway, uh, again, we appreciate uh, you guys coming. And uh, and thank you, Catherine. Uh, keep up the good work out there. Uh, thank you so much. Keep up leading the way for the country up there. And I'm, I'm happy to come in June, July, or August. I mean, I would have been happy to come now. I'll come then, too. If you really want to know us, you've got to come in January. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye. bye. Uh, just so for everybody who's still around, I uh, just want to let you know uh, we have a special opportunity coming up <coughs> two weeks hence in advance of our Tuesday morning meeting at 730. We're going to do a call with the interior delegation. So if everyone can give some thought to things we should be sure to highlight with the interior delegation, again, just know that that call is uh, pre-scheduled for two weeks hence. What's for breakfast? Yeah. Coffee. <laughs> All right. Coffee. Well, thanks, everybody. And, Joma, we'll thanks. We've got a white paper that has...